For the few of you who clicked on this video and haven't seen Avatar The Last Airbender, why? Why did you click on this video? I don't, I, I don't understand, but please continue to watch the video. Heart reacts only. For the rest of you, hey, what's up? We're finally making that Avatar video that we alluded to in our first video ever. And in this particular one, I want to explore a concept that doesn't exist necessarily in the actual Avatar world. Dual bending, or the ability of a bender to bend more than one element without having to be the Avatar. I'm making this video because, one, I find the depth of bending and its possibilities to be fascinating. And two, because I think it's possible, given what we know about the universe and how bending works, that a bender could possibly learn another element besides the one that they were essentially, like, born knowing. There are going to be some spaces in this video where I will have to extrapolate information based on what we know to sort of come to a conclusion that isn't really 100% backed up by evidence in the show. And that's okay, because this is just a theory. A thought experiment. A brain exercise, if you will. I'm doing this in order to prove that dual bending is possible, and I'm going to go over some of the ways that the rules of bending can be pushed, and then I'm going to go over some types of bending that do not necessarily exist in Avatar, but probably could based on the information I'm going to present. But first, let's begin with the basics, and trust me, this is going to help my case in the long run. What is bending? Thank you for asking, human person. You see, in a world of Avatar, some people can magically move elements with their mind by doing cool martial arts moves. Well, actually, it's not their mind that they're using, it's their chi, or chi. Avatar's magic system, or bending, is what's called a hard magic system, which means it sets out rules for the way the magic works, and generally the story follows them pretty closely. So, while the use of chi in Avatar is a form of magic, it has rules which will help us deduce whether or not dual bending is possible. Chi is described by Guru Patik as swirling energy. It's a vital force flowing throughout the body, giving life to every organ, limb, and cell. For benders, chi is used to manipulate the elements in the world around them. They do this by extending its reach from within them and exerting it outward onto those elements. Inside one's body, bender and non-bender alike, there are, this, there are pools of this chi, seven of them to be precise, and these are what is known as chakras. Based on the real-world Hindu teachings, and as Guru Patik tells Aang, The water flows through this creek much like the energy flows through your body. As you see, there are several pools where the water swirls around before flowing on. These pools are like our chakras. If nothing else were around, this creek would flow pure and clear. However, life is messy and things tend to fall in the creek. But if we open the paths between the pools... The energy flows. He also goes on to explain each of the seven chakras, where they're located, what they deal with, and what types of things can block their flow. So, allow Guru Patik to go over the chakras real quick for me. There are seven chakras that go up the body. Each pool of energy has a purpose and can be blocked by a specific kind of emotional muck. First, we will open the earth chakra, located at the base of the spine. It deals with survival and is blocked by fear. Next is the water chakra. Brilliant! Maybe one day you will be a guru too. This chakra deals with pleasure and is blocked by guilt. Third is the fire chakra, located in the stomach. This chakra deals with willpower and is blocked by shame. The fourth chakra is located in the heart. It deals with love and is blocked by grief. The fifth in the chain is the sound chakra, located in the throat. It deals with truth and is blocked by lies. The sixth pool of energy is the light chakra, located in the center of the forehead. It deals with insight 
and is blocked by illusion. The thought chakra is located at the crown of the head. It deals with pure cosmic energy and is blocked by earthly attachment. As you can see, there are chakras for the air, water, earth, and fire elements, but also chakras for sound, light, and thought. These chakras can have an effect on bending, but whether they are blocked or unblocked does not stop a bender from being able to use the basic forms of their bending. A blocked chakra does not stop the flow of chi throughout the body, but rather it partially stops the flow of chi to certain organs and nerve clusters where those chakras reside in the body. However, as we'll go into later, unblocking these chakras can lead to an increase in bending capabilities. So now, you may be using your normal brain to ask, what about a mama? Or the chi blockers? Or Tai Li? Well, if you go back to what I said earlier, Bending is an exertion of the chi within one's body onto the outside world. Inside one's body, chi flows through its own version of veins called meridians. We can see an example of this in the episode The Water Bending Master, when Katara is denied training from Master Paku and goes to learn water healing. They have a mannequin with these chi meridians carved into it. By using water bending, they're able to heal people by directing chi through the body and through these meridians two specific injuries. So what a chi blocker does is temporarily close some of these meridians and render the muscles useless, which stops them from being able to bend altogether. As for Amon, what he does is much more extreme. Think of what a water bending healer would do with these meridians, like with the mannequin, except Amon is using that same skill to inflict harm on the meridians rather than heal. He permanently damages them and essentially removes the person's ability to move chi through those meridians, thus removing their bending entirely. Understanding the mechanics of bending this way gives us a foundation to work with, our first stepping stone in hypothesizing about the potential for a bender to learn another element. And trust me, I've got a lot of theories. Now that we understand what bending is, we're gonna have to talk about the advanced techniques that arise throughout both Aang and Korra's stories. Specifically, how these bending techniques are discovered, because this provides us with some compelling evidence. Advanced bending techniques are things like metal bending, lightning bending and redirection, flying, sand bending, lava bending, combustion bending, and blood bending. There are a couple more in the show, but these are the ones that provide us the most direct evidence of my claim. You see, many of these bending styles employ a sort of bridge between elements. Sand bending is like a mixture of earth and air bending, lava bending is a sort of mixture between fire and earth bending, and combustion bending it could be described as a mixture between fire and air bending, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Generally, in the show, whenever a character would acquire the ability to perform an advanced bending technique, they had to undergo some sort of character development or emotional development. Wait, what do emotions and character growth have to do with bending power, you ask with your normal human mouth? Well, my average homo... <laughs> my average homo friend... <laughs> Sorry. Ah, we're all gay here, it's fine. Well, my average homo sapien friend, that's where the existence of chakras comes into play. I did a lot of research for this video. Please be proud of me, Dad. The unblocking of these chakras can have an effect on a bender's abilities. For example, in the episode Day of the Black Sun Part 2, Zuko confronts his father, Fire Lord Ozai, during an eclipse, when firebenders are unable to bend. Up until this point, Zuko had been feeling immense amounts of shame for lying about killing the Avatar and guilt for betraying his uncle Iroh. By confronting his father, Zuko lets go of all that shame and addresses his guilt. He vows to join the Avatar and to break his uncle out of prison. In doing this, he unblocks his fire chakra, which is blocked by shame. He also might have unblocked his water chakra by addressing that guilt, but we'll talk about that later. Then. The eclipse ends, and this happens. Ah! 
Before this point, Zuko was unable to redirect lightning, and by unblocking his fire chakra, he was able to use an advanced bending technique. This type of advanced bending can develop in a myriad of different ways. The example with Zuko shows a firebender unblocking their fire chakra. However, other types of bending can result from different chakras being unblocked. Like with Toph, when she learned how to metal bend. By seeing past the illusion that metal is unbendable, Toph realized that most metal still contains unrefined bits of earth. Her revelation unblocked her light chakra, which deals with insight and is blocked by illusion. This allowed her to metal bend, which had never been done before. We see all sorts of examples of bending evolving like this in the show. However, some seem to come easier than others. We only really see one character metal bend in Aang's story, and that's Toph. We never see Aang or any other earthbender do it. You have to assume at some point in history, some earthbender had to have opened their light chakra, but none ever attempted to metal bend. This implies that it is incredibly difficult to do. So we can surmise that advanced techniques also require the bender to be more skilled than the average bender. There is evidence in the show that advanced techniques require more chi than regular bending do. Have you ever wondered why almost every waterbender can ice bend, but not every earthbender can lava bend? Well, if we imagine that changing the state of matter is a type of bending, we can imagine the process as one requiring energy, much like in the real world. Whether by heating it up or freezing it, we can expend energy through technology to change the matter's state. And it takes less energy to turn water into ice than it does to turn rock into lava. So for benders, turning water into ice takes much less chi and much less skill than turning rocks into lava. When a character lightning bends or lightning redirects, you can also see how much more effort they have to put into it. And when Katara blood bends, she focuses and exerts herself to do it, beyond what normal bending requires. Advanced bending techniques can only be performed by advanced benders, and often it takes the opening of a chakra in order to have access to that much chi. In The Legend of Korra, Bolin can't lava bend until he faces his fears. Fear blocks the earth chakra, so facing those fears opens his earth chakra, giving him the ability to lava bend. Some characters with advanced bending techniques are not shown to have opened any chakras, but we can make assumptions about their past based on the evidence we have. For example, Sparky Boom Man. He has an eye tattoo on his forehead, which is the position of the light chakra. So we can guess that at some point he trained and opened that chakra, which allowed him to combustion bend. When he uses this ability, his stomach contracts. This is the location of the fire chakra, so maybe combustion bending requires both the light and the fire chakra to be fully open to a skilled bender. Another theory of combustion bending comes from the idea that it is a mixture of air and fire bending, as though air compresses the fire until the pressure allows for an explosion. Plea is the combustion bender from the Legend of Korra and the lover of the main villain in Book 3, Zaheer. You can make an argument that Plea's mastery of combustion bending comes from an opening of her air chakra caused by her and Zaheer's love for one another, as that is what air chakra deals with. Additionally, Plea was originally trained as an assassin, and Zaheer helped her escape that life. Her love for Zaheer might have helped her get over the grief she felt for those that she hurt as an assassin. By doing that, she could have also unblocked her air chakra. Let's go back to lightning redirection for a bit, though. We learn in Aang's story that lightning redirection was invented by Iroh. He studied waterbending techniques and applied them to the fire chakra. Now, this is different from lightning generation, which Ozai, Azula, and Iroh were the only three able to do that in Aang's part of the story. Nonetheless, Iroh demonstrates that when redirecting lightning, it travels from one arm down into the stomach or the fire chakra and then up and out the other arm. Remember when I said that Zuko could have opened his water chakra before redirecting Ozai's lightning? Well, Iroh might have also opened his water chakra when inventing the style of bending. Originally, Iroh was a general in the Fire Nation army. He led the first invasion of Ba Sing Se, which failed. Well, Iroh's own son Lu Ten was a part of that and he lost his life during the 600 day siege. Iroh might have felt guilt for putting his son in danger 
which he might have been able to let go of whenever he began taking care of his nephew Zuko, thus opening his water chakra. Just something to think about. So, if mastering an element and opening a chakra can lead to a new, advanced bending technique, how far can we take that? Could advanced techniques lead to even more advanced techniques? Or could an advanced technique lead to something more, like dual bending? Allow me to explain myself using a couple of theories of mine, one of which is a cop-out, so I'll save it for last. The first theory I have, I'm calling hybrid theory. This is the idea that through progressive advanced bending evolutions, benders of one element could eventually learn how to bend another. As I illustrated earlier, some advanced techniques are almost like halfway points between one element and another. Some bending styles result from someone realizing that the element they're trying to bend resides somewhere they weren't really expecting, like metal bending or blood bending. We can assume that both of these would require an opening of the light chakra to see through the illusion of what is and isn't bendable. And as we see with Iroh and Zuko, you can discover a bending style by hybridizing the techniques of another bending style with your own. But what about bending styles that in and of themselves are like bending two elements at the same time? Sand bending? Your instinct may be just to dismiss it as earth bending tiny rocks. However, sand benders use this technique to create mini tornadoes that power their sand sailors. This is generating wind, which is one step away from air bending. Additionally, we see even a master earth bender having trouble bending sand without training. Toph is barely able to move sand in more than just little waves haphazardly thrown about. Could it be that sand benders are using more than just simple earth bending? What about lava bending? We see both earth benders and fire benders using lava bending throughout the show. If there is a technique that members of two different element groups can do, who's to say without, you know, with enough training and chakra opening that they couldn't take it a step further to fully bend the other element? from earth bending to lava bending to fire bending. If both fire benders and earth benders are changing the state of earth to lava, then could fire benders and water benders not have the same relationship with steam bending? Water benders can already turn water to ice easily. So steam bending would just be the opposite direction, heated water. Well, fire benders can also manipulate heat in a similar way, so Steam bending could act as a bridge between those two bending styles. Now, we know how blood bending generally works, but have you considered that with enough practice, an earth bender might also be able to blood bend? All that iron in those minerals taking control of the blood in someone's veins could mean bending those elements as well. And then we'd have a bridge between water and earth bending. I also theorized before that combustion bending might be a mixture of air and fire bending. I can see a world in which an air bender uses their bending to compress air, much like a combustion bender, leading to an explosion. So that could be a bridge between those two. Which brings us to the final combination of water and air. Weather bending? Cloud bending? I mean, we see Aang bend a cloud into water for them to drink, but that's just bending water vapor. Maybe the bridge between water and air bending is actual weather control, dictating air pressure, evaporation, and precipitation to control weather patterns. I mean, it's possible. I would like to clarify that if this were a possible path towards dual bending, it would take complete mastery of not only one's base element, but also any advanced techniques that would lead to the other element. It would require an entire lifetime of training and opening of chakras to develop. It would probably take generations of study, iterating on whatever progress the last one's made in order to push it closer and closer across that bridge. You're not convinced? That's understandable. Even if benders could push themselves to master techniques that mix two elements, like lava bending, it doesn't mean that they could learn to bend both of those elements separately. You can mix water and earth to make mud, but an earth bender would still just be bending the earth and the mud, not the water itself. Well, that's where my next theory comes into play. Is a person's capacity to bend genetic? 
we see a lot of evidence for this in the show that in order to be a bender, you need to have a parent who is also a bender, and that the types of bending are cultural and regional. It also suggests a genetic lineage in that way. That could mean that no matter how hard they worked at lava bending, an earthbender could never learn to firebend. But what if a person had one parent who could bend one element, and their other parent could bend another? Like Tenzin. Aang was born as an airbender, and Tenzin's mom is Katara, a waterbender. This means that Tenzin has the genetics of both a waterbender and an airbender inside of him. That being said, the son of the Avatar wouldn't necessarily have genetic access to all four elements just because of the Avatar, since the Avatar's abilities to bend are... they come from spirits of past Avatars, not from genetics. Piggybacking off of my previous theory, maybe what I suggested about bending styles that bridge between elements could apply here, so long as the bender has parents of both bending styles. Which begs the question, how come Aang's daughter Kaya can't airbend? She's genetically a bender. Can you only be genetically one bending type? How come some children of benders are still non-benders? Like Aang and Katara's son Bumi? Well, there is evidence to suggest that bending isn't solely dedicated to genetics. For example, the air nomads were entirely made up of airbenders. This is explained as being because they were so spiritual as a culture. Additionally, the harmonic convergence turned many non-benders into airbenders, including people without bender parents. So, is bending genetic or spiritual? Well, my answer is both. Just because some people are born with the predisposition making bending easier and more accessible to them, that doesn't mean that it's the only way bending can evolve. We know that benders can evolve bending by opening their chakras and getting in touch with their spiritual side, and we know that all air nomads were benders. This could suggest that all people throughout the world of Avatar have the capacity to bend, and genetics only affects your predisposition towards it. Which is why I believe that, as long as you have the genetics for bending, even if you are a non-bender, you can learn to bend by going through similar processes as to those that lead to advanced techniques. And if that's the case, then certainly a bender with parents of two different elements could unlock their other element through training and advanced bending techniques. Now I wouldn't expect such a process to be easy either. Much like the hybrid theory, the bender would have to undergo intense training with not only the techniques of their bending, but spiritual training as well in order to unlock, if not all of their chakras, at least the ones associated with their desired bending style. Failing all of that is my next cop-out theory. Lion turtles. They could get the ability to bend a second element from the lion turtles. That's it. So, quick overview of what we learned today. One. Bending is controlled by a user's chi. 2. A bender's chakra can affect their bending, giving them access to advanced techniques. Opening specific chakras can change a user's bending differently than others. 3. Advanced techniques can sometimes be mixtures of elements, and learning to mix elements could help a bender on the path towards learning a second element. 4. Genetics can have an impact on a person's ability to bend, but whether a person can bend is not 100% dictated by their genetics. And five, dual bending is probably possible given that the user does the requisite training and opens the requisite chakras, a process made easier by familial predispositions. Cool? Okay, now for the unscripted outro bit. Thanks for watching this video, guys. It was really fun to make. I did a lot of research for it and uh, had a lot of fun kind of theorizing possible ways for a bender to learn another bending style. Kind of awesome. Um, if you really enjoyed it or you want to see more stuff like it, let us know in the comments. Please like and subscribe to make sure you do see that if we do end up making more stuff like this. And ring the bell to summon invaders into your world. Thanks for watching. Just remember the next couple of lines. <coughs> <coughs> <Fuck. laughs>